And welcome to the season finale of the Film Score Podcast. My guest today is the excellent Gazelle Twin, an experimental avant-garde composer who recently made her first foray into film scoring with Nocturne, which came out right near the end of 2020, and followed it up with The Power, a horror film that she scored about a month ago with the composer Max de Wardner. This is an interview I was looking forward to for quite a while, and the two of us spent a few months trying to get it scheduled, and I was really blown away by hearing her music for Nocturne. It was just such a powerful, raw, and creative approach to to film music and to music in general, and it's brought into the power as well. And because of her interest in film music, and I think her positive experiences so far, I really hope and I'm expecting Gazelle Twin to keep scoring for film. I think she's a really great addition to the voice of film music. And now, as mentioned, this is the season one finale episode. After this, I will be on a hiatus for around two months, after which I'll be back with a whole new slew of composer interviews. I have a few lined up already that I think will be very exciting voices to hear from. Now, in the meantime, of course, listen to this, listen to my back catalog if you haven't, and of course, be sure to check up on all the various composers I've had a chance to talk with. Gazelle Twin, of course, you can find more information about her on her website or on her social media, and as I say every time, you do the same with me. And during my hiatus, I will still be writing about film music probably a little more actively and regularly than I was before, so be sure to check up every week or so to see what might be new. Now, you'll all be hearing from me in not too long. In the meantime, sit back, listen, and enjoy. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Gosh, you've been you've been really busy recently, because back in December you released the score for Nocturne, then I think, was it about a month ago, Deep England came out, and then last night, April 7th, your score for The Power came out. So where are you finding the time to do all these things? <laughs> well, it's lucky that it's really the culmination of, of a few years of work, really just coming into the foreground and just being able to be released. Um, so I really haven't actually been working that much since sort of last summer because I had uh, I had a second child in October so I'm actually on maternity leave and as soon as I went on maternity leave everything started to <laughs> the fruits of all my labor of the last couple of years has just sort of started to come out so um, it, it gives the wonderful appearance that I'm really busy when I'm actually just <laughs> mostly just looking after children but um yeah it's been great it's just really lovely always lovely to see everything wrapped up especially with films being my first two feature films and just to see you know the artwork the posters and all, all the interviews and reviews and just everything coming together it's it's lovely I've released a few records already just you know as, a, as an artist and um, it's always exciting when it gets to release day and the weeks leading up to it and the weeks sort of after following it are always just like a real buzz so I've been lucky because I've been getting lots of highs since Christmas I've been getting you know lots of activity so. It has to be exciting I've obviously heard Deep England I don't know, once or twice I think and obviously that had a lot of really positive buzz a lot of positive reviews and I think it's early because it's just come out but I know at least there was a really positive reaction to the the single that you released for The Power called The Well. So yeah, I mean, that's that's got to be exciting. Do you notice a necessarily a difference in the types of responses to the music for film that you do compared to the solo work that you've done? Hmm, that's an interesting point. I think I'm still catching up with quite a lot of the reviews for the film stuff. I think they tend to focus obviously on, on slightly different aspects. So how things work with the film, how the narrative sort of is you know, represented in sound. And then of course, The Power, my most recent score is a collaboration with another composer called Max de Wardener. So it's interesting to read how you know, how that's been received. I think people probably, when I'm releasing my solo records, they kind of tend to reference what's come before because I tend to change my um, my themes and my identities pretty radically from album to album. But with films, it's kind of just more about the music. You know, what 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 have I sort of dished up? It's sort of sonically. So 
Interesting. And I guess you're mentioning the the collaboration with uh, Max the Wardener, and Deep England was also a collaboration with uh, with the Nick's Drone Choir. Mm-hmm. Has that been kind of a new experience for you, working on collaborations in these in recordings and composing, or is that something that you've had a lot of experience with? Yeah, no, not not much experience sort of previously. Um, I've collaborated sort of with visual artists before, and I've sort of contributed music to things like sound installations, or um, I've made films with animators and things like that. But I've not really collaborated so much with artists. I've I've done guest vocals with various producers over the years, but it's quite different when you're kind of writing, co-writing and and co-producing with someone. I mean, with Nix, it was kind of taking existing material and the the work really was just in kind of shaping the arrangements, which most of which was done by the the choir's leader, Sean O'Gorman. My role was to just kind of be present really and just kind of help move that whole project forward with live performances and the recording which which we did at the tail end of 2019 but it's just been a really wonderful experience to work with them just to work with a group rather than just one other solo artist it, it, it felt very special and as somebody who works alone most of the time it was just a treat to sort of be in a room with other people and to be bouncing the energy around and voice is a very electrifying thing especially in chorus so and I, I, I live and breathe choral music and it's kind of my it was my obsession when I was when I was sort of learning and, and getting ready to, to learn composition. And so to actually be part of choir was really fantastic. Um, and working with Max as well as a collaboration. I mean, Max and I were lucky enough to, to work on another performance actually prior to The Power or during the writing of The Power. We got to do a piece with an orchestra here in, in the UK and perform it in London. That was another real eye-opener and really wonderful experience where I got to use my compositional kind of style and then have it kind of rearranged and expanded into an orchestral performance. So all of that stuff has just made me sort of hanker for more of it really beyond beyond writing my own music, which I do need to do kind of, and I do best in solitude. I think I really do expect to do more collaborations in the future because it just feels like it gives things further life and it can have a new take on things that you wouldn't necessarily get to yourself. So yeah, there's there's really nothing to sort of complain about it really. <laughs> there's, it's just all positive. That's great. And you, you did mention your your interest in choral work. And that's one of the things that, although you mentioned how your, your solo work changes with every release and i mean frankly your your two film scores are similar as well where they're both quite different but there is that thread of the heavy use of voice throughout both in actual lyrics and then just as another instrument that i find it so fascinating when i was listening to the power earlier it was like in some points especially in the track possession it drives and pounds and it's actually like quite terrifying but as far as the actual collaboration goes you mentioned your solo work is you in solitude, and although Nocturne, again, is just you, working on a film in general is also a much more collaborative process. You, did you notice a level of collaboration as well while scoring Nocturne that was different than when you are writing music on your own? Yeah, certainly. I mean, in, in both films that I've done recently, they, they've been um, really led by the director, both of whom have been women, and both of whom really wanted to start getting the music going, really cooking before they would even um, got into production and, and even before casting in some cases. So um, so the whole process was collaborative with them from, from the off. And I found that brilliant because I know I've, I've got quite a few composer friends who've, you know, ended up coming to the finished piece and, you know, coming to bring their music to a finished film, which I, I think is still, would still be a really great thing to do. But for me, it was just helpful because because I'm new to this branch of music. It was just great to see the whole process and how how that would kind of shape. And um, so for Nocturne, the, the director, Zhu Quirk, she, as a classical performer, musician herself, who's been through music, music conservatoires and things, she had a really strong vision for the music and her direction to draw from the classical music that was in the film and to kind of use that as the basis and then to sort of echo that through an electronic score it was just it was she made it quite easy for me really she just kind of she was very clear and she was very brilliant and clear at explaining her her sort of hopes so I found that one just really it was a real bish bash bosh type of job where you just sort of just run with it really 
and my and I've kind of studied a bit of classical music so some of the pieces I kind of I kind of got the the vibe from them and it could just fit really well with you know some of the things that I do which is referencing classical music sometimes and choral music and I can kind of I often treat my voice in a way that you might hear it in a, in a sort of classical setting so it kind of locked in really really nicely really easily. With Nocturne because it does have a heavy use of diegetic classical music that appears throughout the film. I mean, it, it takes place in a, in a music school, so it's not surprising. But did you have a tough time fitting your music in between those classical pieces? I know that you said that they, they influence the music itself, but they are still two quite distinct palettes. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you could easily be forgiven for thinking that there isn't much of a connection, but I think really we were taking the sort of the tonality and, and the keys were, were drawn out. So, you know, many of the pieces are in the same key, so they kind of flow, but, you know, they kind of move through a very clear, distinct change. And I'm echoing a couple of the melodies I'm actually echoing, but I'm kind of warping them slightly. It's it's kind of this kind of in-between dream world sort of state that the film was was kind of suggesting this kind of two two simultaneous worlds and I think that was kind of where I focused really. So how did you how did you get involved in scoring Nocturne given that it was your first feature film? It was really just kind of out out of the blue. Zoo uh, got in touch with my manager and we met her gosh when was that so that would have been that was the end of 2019 as well. Yeah, was it? Can't remember. <laughs> it's a I've lost a year. From the pandemic so I can't remember but yeah we, we met up with her and then it was it was quite a quick process after that she was about to head off to LA to start the process so um it was a very quick but very thorough meeting and and then it all just kind of happened from there and I and you know they were an amazing team I worked with a really great music editor Shai Rizzo who's based in LA and he was extremely key actually to you know to sort of shaping how the music kind of ended up in you know with the picture because I think had I scored to picture you know and had it been down to me I think it would have resulted in quite a different thing but he's really really good at making things lean and stripping back and just kind of building things to the intensity that they needed to so yeah I was very lucky to to have that as my first my first sort of transatlantic job <laughs> so you said that you didn't score to picture so what was your process in in scoring it then i i know that at least two pieces from i think it's unflesh end up in the in the film at least in in part but yeah what was your what was your process in in actually scoring it then to be fair i did do some scenes to to picture so i was working with film um but I, it wasn't kind of solely down to me to sort of cut everything thank god because <laughs> i <laughs> i actually just i think it would have been uh, i went a little too much um at the time to, to manage that as well but like i said shy was amazing and and had loads of brilliant ideas and just helped me focus really i think it was nice just to be sort of let loose on the creative side and then come back to the kind of refining and cutting and whatever later so that was really that was a really nice process it made it kind of really easy for me but really it was just kind of me just ex experimenting um I used a lot of my voice to create drones and to create the more horror scenes that you see in that film they're mostly mostly created through voice um, and I tend to record it very raw in a very raw way and then process, process, process after. And, you know, the effect it gives is kind of sort of in between digital and in between kind of acoustic. So you never really know what you're listening to. Sometimes it sounds vocal. Sometimes it sounds like really messed up strings or it just has a really I just really enjoy the, the result of that kind of process. And then um, I think we were using to, to sort of make it feel contemporary because it's obviously set in the now. I think, you know, I was using some production uh, that I use sort of in more kind of upbeat music, so more electronic beats and synths um, to sort of complement the kind of darker, more kind of organic sort of sounding sounds that you hear in certain moments. So it's real. And then just kind of sparse atmospheric stuff. I didn't want to, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm a real big fan of, of scores that are really lean and really held back and restrained and that aren't just kind of constantly going, you know, and telling you, you know, what you're, what you're meant to feel. Like, I like things that kind of have space and minimalist qualities to them. So I think I was just keeping that in mind, really, and trying not to do too much. But working with the themes, the themes are already strong in the film. The narrative kind of moves quite clearly and quite solidly. So it was really quite easy to sort of create themes that kind of fit and wove through 
the film through the picture. So, so yeah, it was an, it was an enjoyable experience, I mean, and a good good kind of test for me really whether I could actually do something like that and not just like write songs. <laughs> <laughs> But it was it was very kind that they wanted to include a couple of my existing songs as well, and I'm not sure that everybody knows that. Um, if they listen to the score, they might just think that I've made the score. But two of the songs, um, "Unflesh" Flesh" and "Belly of the Beast," were used at certain moments to to really good effect, actually. So yeah, I was happy about that too. Yeah, I mean, and I was I was one of those people when I had first heard it. That score is actually the first piece of your music I had heard, so I had no idea those songs existed beforehand. But it's it's funny you talking about wanting to make something a bit leaner, there are some motifs that are literally like two notes or, mm -hmm. you know, one second of your voice that will pop up at particular moments. And it's, it was really interesting because it's, it's such a minimalist way to score. I mean, and obviously the whole thing isn't like that, but it, that mm -hmm. really caught my attention. You mentioned that you like scores that are quite lean. I mean, what are some of the other scores that you're interested in or that have have caught your eye in the past well there's many and film music has been my and not like choral music it's been sort of my my kind of foundation and, and music education really and sort of gave me the impetus to want to study it to actually compose gosh well you can go from i don't know stuff like morricone pretty much everything i mean i wouldn't say he's <laughs> necessarily he's not he's not really a minimalist but some of his stuff is really you know it's some of the most simple melodies that you could write but they're used to incredible effect and, and that would go for most of his scores and then to something more contemporary uh Mika Levy anything that she's done you mm. know you know she's she's from London she's studied at music school music conservatoire I think maybe somewhere in London and she's you know she she's gone through the live thing she's a solo artist she's she's really experimental she's kind of got all of that going on and she creates really fresh really unusual really restrained genius music so yeah, I, I think there are people like her. There's Clint Mansell, who's, you know, a staple kind of amazing composer who just does really solid work all the time. I'm I'm really a big fan of the sort of, I wouldn't call them a duo, but Ben Salisbury and Jeff Barrett, who write some really amazing scores and TV, TV music and stuff. So there's a whole wealth of film scorers right now that are just, yeah, that I'm just eating up, really. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> They're all great, and I I have to say, like, Michael Levy in particular is, I don't know, so amazing. When I saw Under the Skin in theaters whenever that came out, 10 years ago, I guess, I was yeah. just, I mean, the, the whole film is great, but, I mean, her music, like, blew me away, and it continues to do so. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in any genre, her music has something, and it's hard to define, but it's it's her, it's her character, and it's her intelligence that shines through without that sounding kind of condescending. It's just, <laughs> it's just sort of, yeah, she's, she's, she is an actual genius and she just lives and breathes music. It's just very clear when you listen to her and see her perform or, you know, hear her talk. She's just, she's, yeah, she's a, a rare, a rare one. Yeah. Yeah, she is. And I, I do hope that, not that, you know, she has the opportunity because I'm sure she does, but like that at some point she makes a choice to do something that's more, or a film that's more broader reaching just because she's done a lot of more narrow or niche films. And I, I, mm. I, you know, I just want more people to, to hear what she can do, even if it's not mm. the type of music that is at all mainstream. I'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, me too. I would be too. But I'd be very surprised because she's she's an incredibly self-effacing, humble type of character. And I think, if anything, she... Oh, gosh, I don't know. I don't know her. I, I, I've only met her once a very, very long time ago. And she's... Um, I just think she's a bit of a rebel, actually. So <laughs> she's, I think she probably doesn't like to, to do things to... You know, she's, she's free of cliché and she's free of kind of that, that ambition, maybe, where she just doesn't have to. I don't know. But, yeah, I think whatever she does will be fascinating. Whatever she does next will be fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so one of the things that I found interesting with your solo work and with Deep England is you know, the, the thematic elements behind it. Like Deep England, I mean, you can see it, there's the, the cover art over your shoulder it has this, <laughs> a very, I don't know, like almost a, a neo-paganism. And, and you get that in the the rendition of a fire jump as well from the wicker man does any of that carry over into your film music as well 
I think I just I think it's just in my veins <laughs> yeah I mean I, you know you go back to maybe my first album and it's all in there as well really so but the entire city is you know I was, I was just starting to become interested in early cultures and how those things have kind of echoed through till now you know kind of ritual and religion I'm interested in that just as a person so it kind of naturally comes out in my music but I think also it probably comes from having listened to a lot of religious music chant things like that that just kind of have always formed how I sing and how I write music but I think voice has the power to early rituals and, and rituals music often often includes voice so it sort of ends up being a key thing really especially drone based music which is used for kind of meditation or it's used for kind of summoning you know it has an energy there's something about the drone that has an energy that needs people to to sort of articulate it if you know what I mean I don't know if I'm waffling now but yeah (laughs) (laughs) you know I think there's also maybe something a little primal or intrinsic about it too about the voice and and drone music and the early human ritualism that's all that's involved in it as well Mm -hmm. I don't know a ton about it, but I I always found it quite interesting. And I think the neo-paganism is particularly interesting in in the UK, where you had a lot of neo-folk bands in like the the 80s and and, um, like martial industrial music. And some of the bands like Death and June or Soul Invictus have their own issues. But I've found that kind of an interesting thread that exists there that at least I don't believe really exists in the US. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I see what you mean. There's def- definitely the 70s kind of resurgence of folk music. I think it. I think it's drawing from folk music, which then has, you know, some really deep roots to to our history and to culture. And most of it's quite gnarly and quite dark and um, mischievous and funny and murderous and evil so <laughs> I think it kind of feels like a but yeah it kind of feels like quite a natural kind of theme you, you can sort of re resuscitate it kind of it translates it can always be relevant these stories can always be relevant when wherever you place them in in history so yeah folk music and, and those connections to early music just I think I'd be surprised if they ever you know disappear from people's radar because there's so much to draw from them and I don't consider myself a prog musician by any means but I think it's kind of perfect for that you know for kind of expanding simple themes simple melodies into something that's kind of much more much grander and much more universal. It is really interesting and I mean do you have any pieces or artists that are in that sphere I mean whether now or going back uh, through time that I mean that you'd recommend for people who might have an interest in uh, discovering that sort of music gosh um i'm not actually sure (laughs) i'm not actually sure (laughs) i can't think of do you mean like from the 70s or do you mean just any just like music that kind of draws on folk music or well yeah really music that that draws on folk or that draws on that drone or that ritualism Mm. um i mean a lot of my influences Sort of have come from you know music from early cult uh, early early music so from Europe not just from the UK but from Europe as well I'm just trying to think of something that's that's UK based but you might have stumped me there I might have to go and raid my <laughs> record collection because I'm just trying to like peel through it in my mind and I can't think of anything yeah maybe I'll come back to you on that another time sorry oh, oh, that's that's fine I mean really I should I'm, be able to think of one but I can't I'm I'm asking as much for myself because all I do is I listen to music all day so it has me really interested in, in hearing some of that mm, I mean I mean I can recommend you know one of the one of the composers he's an Elizabethan composer who I became a little obsessed with as a teenager called John Dowland who and he he just created he wrote lots of very mournful songs for voice and it's it's very English sounding and it's lots of it it's about kind of crying and tears and being sad and it was just this right sort of thing for me as a teenager to to be into (laughs) and I used to sing quite a lot of that that music I used to enjoy it because it's very beautiful beautiful melodies and harmonies um I'm sure there's tons more there's probably William Byrd any of his choral music from similar era yeah ton there's loads but it's just trying to remember I haven't I haven't listened to any of that kind of stuff for a long time 
Well, if you if you think of more, uh, more, send it to me, and I'll. I will. Yeah. I'll dive in, and and I'll I'll include it in uh, in the notes for this as well, because hopefully hopefully there are a couple other weirdos like us that want to have a listen to. Oh, I know there. Were, I know there will be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, moving to the power, how did you how did you get involved in that? So that was another kind of nice invitation from Corinna, the director. And it was at very early stages of, of this. Um, I think she'd just kind of written it and was looking into kind of the early stages of, you know, the team, basically. So I heard from her about doing the music, but to initially to discuss whether I was able to do it, but also would I be interested in working with Max Dewardner, who she's worked with before. And um she really gave me the choice, you know, to, she, she was particularly interested in my work because of its sort of female feminine quality. And obviously her script had women at, at its core and the story is about women. Um, so we had a really interesting conversation about that. And I decided, yes, it would be great to work with Max because I did, I know him from contemporary classical music stuff in the UK, in London, especially um, from way back. So I just thought, yeah, actually, I just jumped to the chance, really. I just thought it'd be a really great project. It's a great script. So, yeah, it was just like an instant yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <And> so <laughs> so that is on Shudder now. And Nocturne, I'd say, may not necessarily be a horror film, at least in the traditional sense. But I think you can consider it at the very least a horror-adjacent film. Is there anything about those types of films that particularly draw them to you or you know is it just a coincidence that there's some similarity in the the tone and the the genre of these two films yeah I mean I'm a I'm a fan of horror films and I I I have been since I was little really I saw the debate recently about is Alien a horror film (laughs) (laughs) um Alien is one of my favorite movies of all time and it's something that it just got stuck in my in my brain when I've watched it as a child possibly a little bit too young and it certainly is a horror film I would say yes it is um so uh, yeah I've, I've always been into horror and the moods and the unknown and the kind of wobbliness that it gives you when you're thinking you know if you get really into it it gives you a feeling that's that's thrilling and scary at the same time. I think that's that's something that kind of ensnared me from a young age. So it's always been something that I've enjoyed trying to create as well myself in, in music too. So I think I don't know if it comes from being exposed to that or just it's just there. And um, both of the films that I worked on just had a darkness and a kind of feralness that I really enjoyed sort of creating in 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 sound so I think I just got very lucky with those two films. I think there's probably a a similarity as far as the darkness and the idea of things being kind of frightening in the themes in your music as well. You're not talking about literal horror tropes like werewolves and mm-hmm. vampires but the degradation of society and inequality and justice has its own that's as horrific as anything else I think. Mm. Yeah, there's and and especially with the power, there are some really wonderful parallels with British politics, and it's been kind of quite uncanny to see this film released after the year that we've had and the state of things over here currently politically, um, but also just as a, as a kind of comment on women and and plight of women in this country, especially recently, it's been eerily kind of prescient film that one yeah there's always power in that I think I think it's why people are probably drawn drawn to these genres as well because uh, okay not not so much the blockbuster like you said like these sort of slasher things but when when there's a kind of multiple multi-layered theme it's a way of telling a story that you know can draw you in and can really fixate you and can be a very memorable way of telling a story but also getting a message across so that's the sort of thing that really interests me and pulls me in and and I hope to work on more more things like that if, if I get the chance. I hope so I've, I've enjoyed the uh, the two works so far and I think I don't know if, if saying that it's a, a noble 
idea of pursuit is 100% accurate, but I respect that idea of wanting to work on things that are actually telling something and have some import behind them rather than just, mm. here's another movie, make some money, score it, and that's that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and just, just to sort of give balance to that, I think Nocturne, what Z was vying for with Nocturne was was kind of just this, and, and this is something that she experienced herself, um, is the kind of venomous nature of competition in music and especially classical music. And whilst it's a really much more of a niche kind of topic, it's really, you know, that kind of struck me too, because I, I didn't go that path. I did study at university, I studied music at university, but I didn't go the kind of virtuosic competition based performer sort of route which I know a few people who have and it's it can make or break you and I think she got that across too you know she got that kind of venom and that kind of rage and you know there's way more than I'm maybe giving it credit for in this sort of subtext as well you know there's a lot of feminine focus of stuff frustrations and especially kind of teenage rising up you know as a teenager and as a woman and kind of finding your power and and maybe trusting in something that's kind of a bit more malign than you want it to be but yeah I think she had that going on in her film too just something something really driving a a message that was really driving you know that story from her own experience so I I think that was that was also really cool to to kind of be part of as well. That was actually something that really surprised me in watching the film because I think it's easy to look at it as a modification or rendition of like a a Faustian story of someone selling themselves for power in the pursuit of something. But it just has some really interesting commentary on the creation of music and uh, like you're saying, being a, a, a virtuoso or being successful. There's a very brief speech talking about how all the composers that they're studying never Mm. went to music school like Mm. they were prodigies performing in concert halls when they were six years old and like Mm. obviously no matter how much truth there there is to that it's it's not true for for all music or for all people who are in the classical sphere but at the same time i don't know it it was just really interesting and uh uncomfortable because it's almost like a a predestination that if you hit six eight ten years old and you're not at this point then Mm. the future has closed off for you yeah absolutely it's it's brutal it's a really brutal way of looking at things but it's hard to kind of deny that that probably is the case for a lot lot of people certainly yeah we're looking right near the end and so before any kids start screaming (laughs) uh, we could we could wrap things up okay thank you (laughs) (laughs) thank you that's cool perfect timing